So I want to start this recap by wishing a very, very happy birthday to Hannah. If you're watching, hopefully you know who you are. If you're not Hannah and you're watching, wish Hannah a happy birthday in the comments. So let's get to my round seven recap. I just played a really hard fought game against Ravi Teja from India. A pretty strong international master. And coming into this game, I was expecting a Karo Khan. And my opponent did not surprise me. But I did surprise my opponent. And I actually played a line here that I don't think I've ever played in my life. And it starts with the classical variation, knight c3. Uh, usually I like to play the two knights attack, knight f3 and knight c3. I do have a video on YouTube, how to crush the Karo Khan with the two knights attack. But I played um, probably what's one of the most popular lines against the Karo Khan after takes, takes. Uh, there's two main lines black can play in this position. There is bishop f5 and knight to f6. And this morning I was preparing against both of these moves, uh, but my opponent chose bishop f5, which um, yeah is I think the still the classical main line. I play knight g3, he plays bishop g6, I play h4, he plays h6, and then I play knight to f3. Now I believe, check with the master's database, but I do believe... Ah, knight f3 is still the most common move, and after knight d7... Yeah, so here h5 is a main line, but I chose to play a secondary line. Actually, the, uh, the secondary move, which is only played 5% of the time, which is bishop to d3. Uh, now, there are some small nuances, because usually the main line is h5, bishop h7, and then bishop d3, and then the bishops get traded. So the main difference is having the pawn on h4 versus h5. And in my game, I kept the pawn on h4. And after takes, takes. This position is a bit less common compared to the main line. And the reason for having the pawn on h4 is... Something we'll see a bit later on. Um, hopefully it will make sense within uh, about 10 moves. Why I want the pawn on h4 rather than h5. So going forward from here, my opponent plays e6. I play bishop f4. And he plays queen to a5 check. And this position was on my computer right before the game. And uh, I was prepared with bishop to d2. And here, the only move I looked at for black is queen to c7. And I thought this is the main point of playing queen a5, then dropping back to um, kind of displace my bishop and then follow through with uh, bishop to d6. And I had in mind a, a game uh, that Nepom Niachi played against some lower rated player. And if my opponent went for queen c7, I was going to castle. And the Nepo game went bishop d6, knight e4, bishop f4, Let's see if uh, the game is in the master's database. I'm pretty sure Nepo had this position and missed queen a3. I might be wrong about that, but the, the one game does show queen a3, and I'm pretty sure queen a3 is the strongest move. Uh, idea being that once this bishop is traded, then knight d6 will come, and white should be significantly better. So this didn't quite happen in the game, because instead of queen c7, my opponent played bishop to b4. Now, I just showed that variation because I had it in mind here that I can still try and exploit this d6 square, especially now because the bishops are um, almost guaranteed to get traded. Uh, now, c3 is a natural looking move, but then black can drop back to e7 or d6. So I went for the move which I thought was the most aggressive and also just the most venomous, which is knight e4. Um, now I'm threatening to play knight d6 because the bishop on b4 is pinned to the queen. Uh, so my opponent takes, I take back with my f knight, so still threatening knight to d6. And then my opponent plays knight f6 and just allows me to get in this check and take away casting rights. And I was actually kind of surprised because my opponent played this very quickly. So I wasn't sure if he was like still in some sort of preparation or if he had calculated this back from when he played uh, bishop b4, because he did take about 11 minutes to play this move. But basically, we got to this position, and 
then I was taking my time. Like, do I actually want to go for knight d6? And I ultimately did play knight d6. Uh, he played king e7, so it's somewhat of a forced bond cloud. Uh, Black is not castling this game. And now I have a choice. Do I want to take this pawn? And uh, I pretty quickly arrived at the conclusion that this pawn is not worth taking because yeah, black will get some counterplay. I think queen b4 was the move I was most afraid of. And then, yeah, there's cases where b2 hangs where my knight just gets stuck. So uh, instead of knight takes b7, I play knight to c4. Um, I'm actually really curious uh, about this move, not at all like chess-wise, but about notation-wise. Because when I played this move, my opponent wrote on his score sheet knight 6 to c4. And I wrote on my score sheet knight to c4 um, because my knight on d2 is pinned. So I'm curious what Lee Chess will say. Yeah, Lee Chess says knight c4. Um, I, I'm happy I saved the extra energy writing uh, knight c4 and discarding the 6. Um, anyway, yeah, knight c4, it's a nice square attacking the queen, ensuring b2 is defended, also in some cases rerouting to e5 or e3. So here my opponent plays queen c7, and I castle queenside. And I was feeling good here, uh, especially because black's king is on e7, and it seems like I have a, a slightly more harmonious setup. Like, even though my knights are maybe a little bit weird looking, uh, this king on e7 definitely seems like a, a clear target going into the middle game. And here my opponent played, I think, a very sensible move, rook h2 d8. Uh, basically preparing to tuck away the king on f8 and essentially artificial castle. And in this position, I took uh, a bit of a think trying to figure out what is my plan. And I really wanted to get in this move pawn g4. So I was considering moves like rook to g1 or knight e3 or queen f3 to prepare pawn g4. And after a bit of thinking... I realized I can just play g4 without really supporting it. Um, and ultimately, I did just play pawn g4. Now, this is a pawn sacrifice, but I don't think it's good if black takes it because then I would play rook to g1, actually sacking another pawn here. But the point is now queen a3 check, and I'm going to have time to play rook f1 next move. So, for example, c5, rook f1. And the knight's basically trapped. Uh, there was a brief moment I thought black could play knight h3, but then I realized my queen still controls h3. So I think white is in very, very good shape if we were to go into that line. So going back, uh, I was very happy to get in this move and play it where it doesn't seem like black can take it. And this move uh, basically explains why I didn't play h5 earlier is there are cases where the h-pawn will support this g5 break, especially because black is committed to h6. Um, so g5 is actually a very significant threat. And if I can play this move and kick away the knight, and maybe open the h-file or the g-file, I thought my prospects for attacking black's king are very, very good, uh, with king not really having a long-term safe place. So after I played g4, my opponent took a long think, and he played pawn to b5 after what, about 20 minutes of thinking. And I dropped back to e3. So I was happy to have my knight here supporting the pawn. And also, there are some cases uh, where I can maybe set up knight f5. Uh, but here my opponent plays queen to f4. So active move, attacking the pawn, aligning with my king, also pressuring the d4 pawn. I respond with queen to a3 check, and I was still feeling good. Um, I still have initiative, and my opponent took another think here, because there are a few different moves to consider between pawn to c5 and queen d6 and king e8, and there is one line that excited me if he were to play queen d6, which he didn't actually play in the game. I was going to play g5 with the idea that if takes, I can take with check, so knight would have to move. We throw in takes, takes here. There's some crazy line where I think I can play knight f5 after takes and rookie one. And basically the 
if the king moves and I win the queen for free, and then otherwise a knight has to block and I'll take with check. I thought this looked very good for me. So that might explain why my opponent didn't play queen d6, but rather played king to e8. And um, I thought this was a good success because now the king is stuck in the center. My queen is piercing through on the dark squares. And I follow up with pawn to g5. I was feeling very good here because if black takes, I would take back and then rook h8 is a massive threat. So the pawn can't really be taken. Uh, he played knight to d5. I take on h6. He takes back with pawn. I was expecting queen h6, uh, after which I think maybe knight e4 would come. But pawn takes was a, a slight surprise. Um, and this does fully open the g file. So I pretty quickly played rook to g1, threatening rook g8. And he defends with knight to f6. And in this position, I wasn't entirely sure what the best follow-up is. Um, but I, I tried to keep the initiative. I played queen to c5, attacking the undefended pawn. And then after queen to d6, we actually end up simplifying a bit because I didn't see anything better than to trade queens. And after rook takes d6, I had a cool idea in mind to play this move knight to e4, where it looks like my knight is just hanging, but if black takes it, then I'm the one winning material because black gets skewered on the eighth rank. So knight e4 essentially forces a rook back to d8. And when I went for this line, I was originally planning to take on d5 because uh, the knight would have to take back. And I was thinking about rook g7, but then I wasn't sure if I actually have anything after king e7 and rook g8 coming. So in this position, I took some time and realized I have a, another option is to take the knight on f6. And after he took back, I played the move pawn to f4. And I like this idea of trying to get in this f5 move, uh, essentially to trade off my isolated f pawn and basically leave black with an isolated pawn of his own. So after I play f4, uh, he took a bit of a think and plays king to e7. And it's clear that he wants to get the rook to the g file. And here I decide that the g file isn't so useful for me. Like rook g7 is easily met with rook g8. So I shift over to the e file, rook g to e1. And now I'm threatening knight f5. At least I thought I was threatening knight f5. I don't know if I'm actually threatening to take the pawn. There are cases where my knight would get trapped. But I thought it's nice to align the rook with the black king. And either knight f5 or pawn f5 are both in the air. So here my opponent plays pawn to h5, which is a sensible positional move, trying to get the g4 square potentially for the knight. And I respond with pawn f5, and he plays rook to d6, so reinforcing e6. And here I really wished I could have taken my own pawn, like kind of some self-cannibalism, um, but unfortunately that's not allowed. Knight f5 would be a, a nice uh, pin plus fork would have been a nice pork, but not quite a legal move. So I end up going for pawn takes pawn, and after he takes back with rook, now I play knight f5. Now this isn't quite a fork, but I thought I'm making progress, because after he plays king to d7, I play rook e5. And I was happy to get uh, what we call a collinear move, moving along the same line as my opponent's rook, but not actually taking the rook. And my idea here was I really wanted to pressure the h-pawn, and I thought that either knight g7 or knight g3 are some nice follow-ups uh, to get another attacker against h5. And I also thought that in the event of takes takes, then of course I unleash the rook, I attack the knight, and then I thought that, okay, when the knight eventually moves, I'll more easily be able to exploit the pawn. But I think here my opponent played pretty precisely. And he did take on e5 with idea after I take back, he has knight to d5. And I was still feeling good because I, I played this move knight to g7. And I thought this is a really nice move, preventing king e6, attacking the pawn. And if he defends the pawn, I was going to play rook to f1, attacking the f7 pawn and preparing rook f5. And I thought if we go into this line, king e7, rook f5, then white has very good chances win the game because h5 is just hanging there's no way for black to defend but my opponent instead of playing rook h8 
played rook g8, just gives me the pawn, and then plays king e6 in this position. And um, yeah, pretty quickly I realized that I'm just losing the pawn back. There's no hope in saving both e5 and h4. Like if I play rook e1, he's going to have something like rook h8. So here I decide to simplify. I play knight f6, and after rook h8, I take on d5. He takes, and I play rook to f1. And going forward from here, uh, things simplify even further. After rook h7, I play a4. He takes, I play rook f4, uh, defending and attacking. And then pawns begin to come off the board after king takes e5. Rook takes a4, he plays f5, king d2, f4. Uh, it does look like he's winning this pawn, but whenever he takes the pawn, then a7 will be hanging. So we played a few more moves. King e2, rook c7, c3, rook b7. I play king f3. More pawns come off. And after rook h2, rook e7, king f6, he offered a draw, and I agreed. And another game ends peacefully after what I think was a very interesting battle. And I don't think I was ever in like trouble this game, but I'm super curious if I had chances to push more for a win. So as usual, I'm gonna check with the engine. I have not checked at all with Stockfish so far. So let me switch the chapter here, enable and Let's make sure people can see. Mm. So not a perfect game. Apparently we each made one inaccuracy. Uh, let's just go back. So yeah, the first several moves were all opening theory. We were following some Grandmaster games. Okay, Bishop B4 is a playable move. And yeah, 94 is maybe one of the most testing responses. Interesting. So, so bishop takes d2 was perhaps a small novelty, but still a very playable move. And then going forward from here, I do see the small blip in the graph. So what was my chance? g4 best move. Interesting. So knight takes g4 was a better option for black. Yeah, this looks terrifying for black. Rook takes g7. And Stockfish slightly prefers this line, but I think this would be uh, very difficult for black to defend. So after b5, this was black's inaccuracy. So what was my inaccuracy? Ah, in this position, queen a3. Queen a3 is one of the best moves. I didn't, I don't think I even considered rook h3. It's an interesting idea, rook f3. White's still better here. g5, okay. Stockfish prefers rook hg1. And then here, ah, so rook g1, I guess, gave up my whole advantage. Yeah, I played this move pretty quickly, thinking it's just a natural move, but. The engine prefers taking and then taking and then rook g1. I guess the difference here is black has committed the pawn and doesn't have time to play knight f6 and knight takes d5. And okay, I guess this is this is understandable that yeah, black is still suffering with the king in the center and we're keeping queens on the board. It's probably not good for black to ever take at least right away. But okay, after rook g1, it seems like the play was very, very clean. Also very, very drawish. And okay, so another pretty clean game. Um, definitely some interesting moments in the middle game, but can't be too upset. Um, this puts me at three and a half out of seven. There are two more rounds to go. So I will admit I'm pretty tired. Like this, this is one of my longer games in the tournament. I haven't had too many games exceeding 40 moves. So I think it's time to find some food and hopefully sleep early tonight. Um, yeah, two more games. I am one point behind Magnus Carlsen. 
Uh, Magnus has four and a half. I have three and a half. So I don't think I'm going to get a chance to play him, but you never know. Uh, do stay tuned, and I look forward to seeing you guys in the next video. Adios.